Good evening, and it's a privilege to welcome you to our March Jewish Parents Forum conversation. I'm Caroline Brick, Executive Director of Tikva's Jewish Parents Forum, and we are live from the Tikva Center in Midtown Manhattan. We have hundreds of parents joining us tonight. In fact, when I last checked, I believe 830 total registered. To our returning parents, it's great to see you again, and to our new parents, welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Tikva, the Jewish Parents Forum, and why we're sitting down here tonight. Tikva is a think tank and an ideas institution. We incubate and produce some of the most important scholarship in the Jewish world today, and we also educate thousands of young Jews through our many educational programs for middle school, high school students, college students, and young professionals. Our guiding belief at Tikva is that ideas matter and that exposure to good ideas can never begin too young and certainly never gets old. In a moment like this, when it seems that many radical or even bad ideas have infiltrated our culture, media, and academic institutions, it's all the more critical to convene, to convene our community of learners around good, enduring ideas. This foundational belief guides our Jewish Parents Forum a community of over 6,000 parents and grandparents committed to raising morally courageous and proud Jews and Americans. The Jewish Parents Forum convenes monthly for in-person discussions around the most relevant and urgent topics facing Jewish families in America today. Tonight we'll discuss an issue that's weighing heavily on Jewish families at the moment, and I know this because I'm in touch with many parents. What is American culture doing to our children? and what can we as Jewish parents do about it? Anyone who's concerned about the well-being of society ought to be especially concerned about the well-being of its young people. Unfortunately, today we're seeing several disturbing trends affecting American girls, boys, and even schools. American boys on average are far less resilient and ambitious than they were 20 years ago, and the gender gap in academic achievement has widened dramatically with boys now falling behind their sisters. And American girls are suffering from unprecedented rates of anxiety and depression, f driven by the pressure to perform on social media and the weakening of bonds across generations. And our nation's schools are often unknowingly contributing to these issues. So tonight we're going to examine these trends and explore what's at the root of these issues and what can parents do about it? I'm honored to have this conversation tonight with Dr. Leonard Sachs, internationally acclaimed author and educator, and a family physician and psychologist with over 30 years of clinical experience for a dynamic discussion about how contemporary American culture is impacting our children, how parents can reassert their authority, and how Jewish tradition can serve as an invaluable guide to human flourishing as our sons and daughters come of age. Thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. I'd like to begin our discussion by diving right in and discussing American girls, because I think in many ways, American girls provide a great window into the greater culture. It seems every day I read a new article about the epidemic of depression and anxiety among teenage girls. And in fact, according to a recent CDC poll that just came out, 60% of teen girls in the U.S. are experiencing sadness or hopelessness, which is double the rate of boys, and that rate is up 60% from a decade ago. So, Dr. Sachs, tell us, what is going on with American girls? Well, there's a number of factors in play that have driven that rise in anxiety and depression among American girls, but I think we can say with confidence, based on the research, that social media is a major factor there. Uh, as recently as 10 years ago, I mean, we've got good uh, uh, studies looking at how American girls spend their time. And as recently as 10, 12 years ago, uh, adolescent girls were spending a lot of time talking with friends, face-to-face, -face, on the phone, hanging out with friends. That's much less common today. American girls are spending less time face-to-face -face with their friends, less time on the phone with their friends, and more time looking at screens, social media, Instagram, TikTok. And we now are beginning to get an understanding as to why that's really toxic for girls especially, girls more so than boys. So it's impossible to talk about teenage girls without really discussing TikTok. 
and many in the many parents in the room might have daughters in TikTok, or many parents have younger kids and will soon be faced with whether or not to permit TikTok. Even the Biden administration is starting to weigh in. Um, what is uniquely harmful about TikTok, and what do you think parents need to know that they might not know? Okay, so that's a, a really important question because TikTok is all by itself a major game changer. So the big social media before TikTok, social media like Instagram or Facebook before that, um, Instagram and Facebook were all about connecting you with people you knew or people you were interested in, celebrities. Um, TikTok takes a completely different approach. TikTok says, I have no interest in who you know or who you want to know. I want to know what you like. So tell me a little bit about what you like. And then they start offering you videos. And the algorithm is so clever. It's watching how much time you're watching this video. And did you watch it over? Did you watch the whole thing? And then it starts customizing what it's offering you. And within an hour, I've heard from so many teenagers who say things like, TikTok knows me better than I know myself. TikTok knew I was gay before I knew. Um, and it is bringing kids down a rabbit hole. So as I mentioned to you earlier, I've uh, corresponded with and spoken with Gene Twenge, who I regard as our nation's leading researcher on social media and teenagers. And uh, back in 2019, she published a huge study. She and her colleagues published a huge, huge study, over 200,000 adolescents on the x-axis was time on social media, and on the y-axis was the likelihood of becoming anxious and depressed. And there's no upward deflection in that curve until you get it to about 35, 40 minutes a day on average. So, you know, when I speak to parents, my presentations are evidence-based. So I'd show the graph and I'd say, okay, so social media up to 30 minutes a day is fine for teenagers. But that study was published in 2019 based on data before 2019. So it's really pre-TikTok. Over the last four years, things have changed. So I reached out to Gene Twenge more recently and I said, Hey, look, the more recent research is saying there's no save point in that trend line. The, it, it goes to zero. And she said, yeah, there's, there's, and we both understand why. It's because TikTok has changed, changed everything. And I said, so teenagers shouldn't be on TikTok at all. And she said, that's right. And I said, can I quote you? And she said, yes, you can. So quoting Jean Twenge here, Nobody under 18 should be on TikTok. That's a real change from four years ago because TikTok's a game changer. Um, an analogy I've made very often is to alcoholic beverages. Imagine that alcoholic beverages had never been discovered. Somehow we got to this point in civilization, no one had ever figured out how to ferment anything. And then over a space of 20 years, people discovered beer, wine, whiskey, brandy, mixed drinks. How long would it take us to figure out that maybe 14-year-olds shouldn't drink alcoholic beverages? I don't think it would be immediately obvious. On the contrary, I think it would be very likely that we'd have a culture where all the cool kids were getting drunk. That's the situation you're in now. This is new. This is different. I assert, and others like Jonathan Haidt would agree, that Social media is as profound a change in the human experience as alcohol, for sure. And yet it's just happened. It wasn't a thing 20 years ago, and now it's everywhere. So I think my analogy is a good one. And so I counsel parents, look, you've got to be the courageous parent when your daughter says, but all the other girls are on TikTok. You have to have courage to do the right thing. So we often hear about ways social media impacts our children's attention or their mental health, but you've written extensively about how it impacts our children's character, which I find very interesting. So what virtues does social media erode and what does it promote instead? So social media is a tool. It can be used well or badly. I'm not at all saying all social media is wrong. You know, you can use social media to promote awareness of homelessness and raise money for good causes, and that's fine. But that's not how most American 14-year-olds are using it. When researchers actually look at how American teens are using social media, it's all about broadcasting me. Here I am 
uh, at the game. Here I am at the party. Here I am picking my nose. It's all about me. It's a relentless focus on me. And kids are competitive. And your friend has 500 likes on her TikTok video. You'd like to get 1,000 likes. Well, how do you do that? Uh, and that focus on me and looking to see how many likes I'm getting is really toxic. The virtue it is eroding is the virtue of humility. And as you know, in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I devote a chapter to humility. I assert that humility is the most un-American of virtues, and if we're going to raise a child in this country, it's the most important virtue to teach. And kids are utterly clueless. So I was speaking at a Catholic school, middle school, and they'd asked me to do a homily. They asked me to choose a verse from the Bible. I chose Micah chapter 6, verse 8. So in the book of Micah, the prophet is saying, okay, what does the Lord require of you? You've got to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. He says, no, that's not what the Lord re requires. It's very simple. Here's what the Lord requires. Asot mishpat v'ahavat chesed v'atznealechet imalehecha. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So then I turned to the sixth graders. I said, okay, walk humbly with your God. What, what does that even mean? Humility. I said to the kids, raise your hand if you think you know what the word humility means. So this boy raises his hand, and I call on him, and he says, humility means trying to convince yourself you're dumb when you know you're smart. I said, actually, that's not humility. That is psychosis. I said, let me offer this uh, definition to you. Humility means being as interested in other people as you are in yourself. And the kids are all giving me a blank look. They have never received any instruction in humility, but I don't blame the kids. How should they know if they've received no instruction? I was talking to the parents about the virtue of humility. And during question and answer, a mom is really pushing back hard. She, uh, I call on her and she says, look, I don't know if we teach my daughter the humility. You know, come on, with that big job opportunity comes along, I wanted to go for it. I wanted to have high self-esteem. I don't want to teach her to be humble. And I said, Mom, with all due respect, you're confused. You're confusing being humble with being timid. Those are not the same things. They're very nearly opposites. And the virtue you want for your daughter is not self-esteem. The virtue you're thinking of in that situation with the big job opportunity, the virtue you want for your daughter is courage. Courage means you know your inadequacies, your weaknesses, your shortcomings, and you find the strength to push forward anyhow. So. A lot of confusion among American parents. That's very interesting. Um, I often hear parents make the following argument. Obviously, we know social media is bad. Um, but they'll say, you know, these platforms are unavoidable. They're a part of modern life. My kids will soon be out of my house, and they'll have access to it. Isn't it better if I teach them boundaries or to have you know, a healthy relationship with their devices? And might there be a rebound effect if I ban it and then send them off into the world? Okay, so what a would your response be? A couple different questions there. Let's take each of them. One is technology. Look, social media is part of the real world. Kids need to be comfortable in the real world, which includes social media and technology. So why not let them, you know, get their feet wet, get experienced, because that's what the real world is. And there's a number of answers to that, but one that I like, and our time is limited, uh, is to talk about the Waldorf School of the Peninsula. So this is a school in Los Altos, California, the heart of Silicon Valley. I had the privilege of leading a workshop some years back that these teachers attended. So the Waldorf School of the Peninsula, no screens, no nothing, no, no technology whatsoever. And the chief technology officer at eBay sends his kids there. The, the, the senior executives at Apple and Google, which are right around the corner, send their kids there. And so Matt Richtel of the New York Times asked the parents, at these executives at Apple and Google, why are you sending your kid to a school where iPads are strictly forbidden, where kids are reading from books made from dead trees rather than looking at screens ever? And the Apple executive says, look, we can teach any 10-year-old to use an iPad. Uh, I don't need to send my kid to school to learn an iPad. I want my kid to go to school to learn how to think, to learn how to debate, 
uh, to make their case in an interaction with a human being. And you don't learn that from an, an app. You learn that from interaction with real people. So this notion that, well, the technology is out there and kids need to use the technology. Look, the technology is changing so rapidly. Let's suppose, you know, 10 years ago, you became a master of Facebook. Well, TikTok's utterly different. TikTok's all about short form 10 second videos, which is really not what Facebook is about. Becoming skilled at Facebook is not going to automatically transfer into TikTok. Some users have told me it's really a disadvantage. You got to unlearn what you learned on, on Facebook. You know, I remember when I was in middle school, we all had to learn to use a printing press to make business cards because that was technology in, in the medieval period. Um, <laughs> Uh, technology changes. You don't, your kid doesn't need to worry about technology. Your kid needs to learn, uh, learn about thinking and reasoning and understanding and perceiving. And those are human skills. Those are not skills you get from an app or from uh, a device. I want to now turn to boys. You've been in practice for 30 years. What are the greatest challenges facing American boys today, and what changes have you seen over your decades in practice? <laughs> okay, so I remember as a medical doctor, as a family doctor in Maryland in the mid-90s, I was like, boy, what is, what is wrong with Montgomery County, Maryland? Because I was seeing all these families where the girls were superstars getting straight A's and the boys were goofballs, uh, doing much less well than their sisters in the same family. Uh, uh, but I began to, and that was such a surprise to me because I attended public schools in Ohio, K through 12, and I remember uh, the honors ceremony, uh, the kids who were being uh, honored for their achievements, the uh, editor of the school newspaper, Andy Borowitz, who's gone on to have a great career. He writes the Borowitz Report for the New Yorker magazine. Um, he was one year ahead of me at Shaker Heights High. Uh, the editor of the Poetry Journal was a boy. The editor of the yearbook was a boy. The uh, winner of the prize in foreign languages was a boy. They were all boys. And back then, people were, were writing books. Myra and David Sadker wrote a book called Failing at Fairness, How American Schools Shortchange Girls, because all the higher achievers were boys. And so that's why I was startled in Montgomery County, Maryland in the mid-90s, like, what's wrong with Montgomery County, Maryland? Because at our high school in Montgomery County, all the high achievers are girls. But I began to reach out to colleagues, and I discovered, OK, some things have changed. This is not 1977. And girls now outperform their brothers, and it's just been a deluge since that time. But it's not the case that girls are doing so much better. If, if the gender gap was widening because girls were doing much better than they used to, that would be cause for celebration, but it's not true. The gender gap is widening not because girls are reading more, but because boys are doing less. And that's the problem. So much has been written recently about the feminization of higher education, and recently there was an article in City Journal about this, but you've written extensively about the feminization of lower education and how it's contributing to this type of issue that you just mentioned. So what is happening in classrooms and how is it negatively impacting boys? Yeah, so I visited an elementary school and the principal and I had worked out my agenda for the day, which was going to begin with visiting classrooms and then meeting with students in assembly and then a workshop for teachers and then in the evening going to speak to parents. So beginning of the day, I'm in the principal's office waiting for, you know, she's busy. She'll be with me in just a moment. Over the next few minutes, nine kids, one by one, come into the principal's office. They've all gotten in trouble. And these are boys in kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Well, I'm actually pretty good at striking up a conversation with six-year-olds. Uh, it's one of my skills. <laughs> so um, what are you guys doing here? We got in trouble. What'd you get in trouble for? The teacher said, draw a picture of anything you want. And I drew a picture of machine gun. And I got sent down here. Me and Jason were pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead. Um, Kay Heimowitz wrote a book uh, about this growing gender gap, and she tried to understand why is this growing. And she said, well, the problem is, is that a generation ago, 
uh, young men thought they had to be breadwinners and the woman would stay at home and raise the kids so they had to achieve. But she said, uh, young men are now, and I'm quoting, uncertain about their role as providers in the global marketplace of the 21st century. And she says, that's why boys are now less motivated. I know she's wrong because I asked these boys at this elementary school, what do you guys think about school? We hate school. Um, why do you hate school? Not one of these boys said, well, I'm uncertain about my role as a provider in the global marketplace of the 21st century. Boys doing things that boys have always done, pointing fingers at each other, saying, bang, bang, you're dead, throwing snowballs at one another, drawing pictures of weapons, writing stories in which people get killed, now gets you in trouble. We have me made being a boy and doing things that boys have always done grounds for discipline referral. And the result is that boys now at five, six, seven years of age has decided school's stupid, I hate sc school. And we got a lot of research from Deborah Stipek at Stanford and others showing that once kids form those negative attitudes towards school, those attitudes are global, stable, and non-contingent. It's gonna be very hard to change their mind. Well, my five-year-old recently drew a picture of a car crash, so <laughs> I feel a lot better. Good. <laughs> So you're also a, a psychologist. So tell us what happens to boys when they feel criminalized in the classroom? So in my book, Boys Adrift, I talk a lot about how education has changed. Uh, you know, I recently, as I mentioned to you, I shared a podium with Christina Hoff Summers, who wrote a book called The War Against Boys, in which she asserts that these changes happen because of a left-wing liberal conspiracy. Uh, with all due, uh, led by Hillary Clinton, uh, she, she went on, with all due respect to Christina, um, Hillary Clinton's not that organized. Um, <laughs> these changes did not arise because of a left-wing conspiracy. They came about because good people with good intentions made changes that had the unintended consequence of disengaging boys. But the result, which is what you're asking about, is we got a growing proportion of boys who feel like, hey, I'm not welcome at school. I wrote uh, another uh, boy uh, at a school I visited, wrote a story, and the teacher said, write a story about whatever you want. He wrote a violent story in which people killed each other and he was suspended from school. Uh, and the parents, he was not allowed to return to school until the parents got an evaluation from a licensed psychologist saying he posed no imminent danger to himself or to others. And, and that really struck me because when I was a high school senior at Shaker Heights High in Ohio back in 1977, our lead teacher for English, Robert Hansen, nominated me and three other students to sit for a, uh, a, a competition, National Council of Teachers of English. And Proctor gave us each a blue book, said you have 45 minutes, write a story. And I wrote a story in which people shot each other and got killed. And my mom died in 2008 and going through her papers after her death, I found that she had saved the certificates sent to our home by the NCTE awarding me their highest honor in creative writing. Boys have always written stories about other pe people killing each other. Uh, 40 years ago, it could get you an award, as it did for me. Now it gets you a discipline referral. The end result of these changes is boys who think academic excellence is for girls. I call it Hermione Granger syndrome. <laughs> I have visited over 460 schools over the last 20 years, and I see many schools now where the girls are wave, waving their hands and the boys are sitting silently because raising your hand, being engaged and motivated is now uncool for boys if they are white, black, or Latino. That's somewhat less true of Asian boys. So if you're a mother to a boy and you see this happening in your kid's school, any advice for how to broach this with the school or the teachers? Yeah, first of all, reach out to other parents. One parent is an annoyance, but two or three parents, you'll get more attention. So talk to your fellow parents, see if other parents are finding the same thing, and then meet face to face. This is not a topic for an email. The only role of the email is to set up a time to talk. Emails quickly become adversarial, and people are defending their position, and it's not productive. Instead, go in and talk to the teacher and say, you know, I have the highest respect for what you guys are doing here, but my son came home, or this has actually happened to another parent in my practice, uh, the teacher had given gold stars to pictures she liked, 
so Andrew came home from school and he started throwing out all of his crayons and all of his art materials. He loved to draw. He's six years old, loved to draw, but throwing everything in the garbage. And mom, why? And he's in tears. I'm never going to draw again. Turned out the teacher had given a gold star to almost everyone else, but not to Andrew. Why? Because Andrew drew a picture of a knight cutting the head off a dragon. And mom called the teacher and said, why didn't you, why didn't you give my son a, a star? And she said, well, I don't want to condone violence. And she said, what's well, a six-year-old and it's a knight and a dragon? And she said, I've realized that. That's why I did not make a referral. Normally, if a child engages in violent behavior, I will make a referral, but I didn't. And, and mom moved her son from that school to a boys' elementary school. So that, you might have to do that. If you reach out and the teacher's like, nope, I'm sorry, boys are never allowed to draw pictures of knights attacking dragons that's utterly forbidden because we don't want Columbine at this school. Uh, if, you don't, if you reach out and you are rebuffed, then you need to look at a different school. And here in New York City, you have infinite choice. There are many, many good opportunities. Uh, and even in other cities across the United States, uh, you have choices. Do your homework. Find another. If, if your school rebuffs you after you reach out and they have no interest, I would also, shameless promotion, offer them a copy of my book, Boys Adrift, because in my book, Boys Adrift, I present the evidence that these zero tolerance policies for violence are not helpful. They don't accomplish anything except to convince boys that school is stupid. Uh, and I've got over 400 scholarly references in the book to support that point. So give them a copy of Boys Adrift. But if the school pushes you back, then you have to find a different school. And if you're in any American city, there's good schools to find. City. Now, I was in Minot, North Dakota, which is a small town, and you don't have a lot of options in a small town. But if you're in a big city, you can always find a better school. And my wife and I moved from Montgomery County, Maryland to Chester County, Pennsylvania, because we were not happy with the schools available to us. So worst case scenario, you might have to move to find the right school. So we've now explored the major challenges facing American girls and American boys. And I'd like to now turn to practical solutions. And I think we can't start with practical solutions without addressing parental authority, which you speak about extensively in your book and you think underlies a lot of these issues. So what is parental authority and why is it so important? Okay. So in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I talk about how American popular culture now undermines the authority of parents. Well, what's the evidence for that? Or is this just a rant? Well, no, we've got actually really good uh, evidence. So uh, 60 years ago, a team of sociologists from Johns Hopkins went across the United States interviewing teenagers. Uh, and one of the questions they would always ask is, if all your friends wanted you to join a, wanted you to join a particular club, but one of your parents did not approve, would you still join? And in that era, 60 years ago, the majority of American teens said no, they would not join because the opinion of one parent counted more than the combined opinion of all their peers. Over the last 12, 15 years, I've posed an updated version of Dr. Coleman's question to American teenagers at middle schools and high schools. I've said to them, if all your friends wanted you to sign up for a particular social media site or app, would you consult your parents first? And the most common response I get from American teens is not yes, it's not no, it's laughter. They, they think it's a great joke. They burst out laughing. You know, as one girl said a few years back, she said, you know, my parents would probably think TikTok is some kind of alarm clock, you know, why would I ask them? These kids may say they love their parents, but the opinion of their peers matters more. That's what I mean. I mean that parents need to matter more than peers. And the culture has undermined parents' authority. We don't live in the culture of the Andy Griffith Show anymore. We live in the culture of the Disney Channel, which is really toxic. Uh, and parents need to be aware of that. So tell us more about the TV shows. What did TV shows in your day okay. promote, and what are they promoting now? Okay, again, Because the Disney Channel sounds pretty good, if you ask me. Uh, <laughs> so what are you talking about? I'll tell you. So, uh, we, again, we, um, my presentations to parents are always evidence-based. I always have an online handout with 10 pages of scholarly references 
to, to support every point I'm making. So one of the studies I cite there, researchers at UCLA looked at the most popular TV shows targeting children from 1967, 1977, 87, 97, 2007, 2017. And quantified each show in terms of what is the show teaching? What's important? What matters in the world of that show? So from 1967 through 1997, they found great consistency. Whether it was the Andrew Griffith show in 1967 or um, Happy Days in 1977, or Family Ties in 1987, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer in 1997. Those are very different shows. But one thing they have in common is the message they were communicating. According to the researchers, those shows consistently were communicating the message that the most important thing is to do the right thing. To tell the truth, even if it hurts. To be a good friend, even when that's not easy. Being famous, being wealthy, we're number 15 and number 16 out of 16 for 30 years. But then between 1997 and 2007, American culture flipped upside down. You look at the most popular shows from 2007, shows like Survivor, iCarly, American Idol. Suddenly it's all about winning, doing the right thing. That's gonna get you voted off the island. And it only got worse in 2017 and it's only gotten worse since then. So American culture changed profoundly in just 10 years between 1997 and 2007, and it's continued down the same bad road since then. And incidentally, the researchers ask why? What caused American culture to flip upside down in 10 years time? Doing the right thing became the least important thing. Being famous and winning became the most important thing. And the answer the UCL researchers get, give is social media. Social media transformed the culture profoundly. Suddenly it's all about how many likes you have and how many people are following you. And so winning and being famous is now the most important thing. So what happens when peer authority eclipses parental authority? Okay, so this goes back to, again, the Joseph Coleman research from Johns Hopkins showing that 50 years ago, 60 years ago, kids paired, cared about what their parents thought and the parents were the primary attachment. We've got lots of research which I present in The Collapse of Parenting showing that over the last 30 years, kids' primary attachment has shifted from parents to peers. In other words, the opinions that kids really care about is no longer their parents' opinion, it's their peers' opinion. And that's really dangerous, it's really toxic, and here's why. Let's suppose my daughter says to me, I hate you. I'm never going to talk to you ever again as long as I live. She never said that, but let's suppose she did. If she were to say that, her mother and I would consult and decide what privileges she would lose and for how long. But nothing fundamental would change. Her place in our house would not change. Her, our love for her would not change. There's nothing that she could do or say that would cause us to stop loving her. And she knows that. And so she can rest secure because we are her primary attachment. But suppose she says those same words to a girl at school. I hate you. I'm never going to talk to you ever again. That friendship is over, or it is at least very badly damaged. Peer relations are contingent and ephemeral. They can change in one day. They can change in five minutes, and every girl knows it. You want to see an American teenage girl have a total meltdown? Take her phone from her without warning, and she will totally freak out because she'll be like, Emily doesn't know I don't have my phone. What if she texts me and I don't answer? She's going to think I'm ignoring her. She's going to think I don't, don't like her. And so they're glued to their phones because you can't let that text go unanswered because peer relations are contingent and ephemeral. When peers matter more than parents, kids become anxious because you may be the most popular kid today. That could change tomorrow, and you know it. It's, it's built on sand. So not only are you a psychologist and a doctor, but you're also a pretty learned Jew, which is very exciting. So what does our tradition have to tell us about parental authority? Okay. So Deuteronomy 6. And you shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you this which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. Vishinantam Levanecha. Now that next 
verse is usually translated something like, teach them diligently to your children, but that's not what the Hebrew says. It would be easy to say that in biblical Hebrew. The verb there would be labed, to teach, but the verb there is not lamed. The verb is shanan. Shanan, as Robert Alter and others have shown, means to chisel in stone. So a better translation of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 would be something like chisel these laws in the hearts of your children, incise these laws, inscribe these laws in the hearts of your children. You'll find that exegesis of Deuteronomy 6 on page 133 of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, on the next page. I quote a regular columnist for the New York Times, Jennifer Finney Boylan, who wrote a column about enlightened parenting in which she asserts that enlightened parenting means, and I quote, setting your child free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong, and if in so doing your child becomes a stranger to you, then so be it. That may seem enlightened to some readers of the New York Times or listeners to National Public Radio, but it's not enlightened. If you set your child free to discover that for themselves their own right and wrong, and they live in the United States and they have internet access, what they will discover is Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Bruno Mars, Drake, a culture of mainstream pornography, a culture of disrespect. Uh, and the wisdom of the Jewish tradition is that you are commanded not to do that. Don't set your child free. That's not the Jewish tradition. The Jewish wisdom is vishinantam lefanecha. Incise these laws on the hearts of your children. And that is wise. And you and I have also spoken about the commandment to honor your parents mm -hmm. and that choice of word. Yeah. So, ve'ahavta et adonai. Love God. Love your God. Love the Lord your God. Ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. Leviticus 19.18. Dative case. So, ve'ahavta et adonai. Accusative case. Love the Lord your God. And I've discussed this with a number of rabbis who have said, yeah, that's a significant difference because you're moving from the accusative case to the dative case. Show that love to your neighbor. But you are never, never commanded to love your parents. You're commanded to honor your parents. And again, there's great wisdom there because you can't always love your parents, but you can honor your parents. And that is a commandment. So the, if there's any commandment in contemporary American culture, it's that there can be no such thing as an unchosen moral obligation. Nobody can impose an obligation on another. And that's, that has a very contemporary New York Times feel. It's profoundly un-Jewish. We embrace the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. You are commanded to honor your mother and your father. You might not want to, but there's so much wisdom in the Ten Commandments. Uh, and it's not asking you to do, going back to Mo Moses' speech at the end of Deuteronomy, you're not being asked to do anything that's beyond what you can do. You're not being asked to love your parents. You're being asked to honor your parents. That's a matter of will. You can do that. That's an, a very important distinction. So how do parents reassert their authority? Okay. How do they strengthen bonds across a generation? All right, so lots of very concrete suggestions. Um, you can't have a family life if the family is not together. So supper time at home. I present lots of research showing that there are enormous benefits to supper at home with at least one parent. And, you know, I see parents at the school and they're picking up their kids and driving them to soccer practice and computer coding class and they're eating on the way from one activity to another. And the unintended message they're sending is that being amazing and doing all these amazing things is more important than a relaxed time at home with family. Don't send that message. Cancel the computer coding class time at home instead. And, and kids climbing into the, into the car and I watch them put on their earbuds. No earbuds, no headsets in the car. When your kid's in the car with you, sh you should be listening to her and she should be listening to you, not to Cardi B or Megan the Stallion or Bruno Mars. Uh, no earbuds, no headsets in the car. 
vacation. When you go on a vacation, your daughter asks if she can beg her best friend. No, she can't bring her best friend. Because if she brings her best friend, it's going to be her and her friend going up in the chairlift together. And all you've done is subsidize a very, very expensive play date. The point of the vacation is to build the connection between you and your kid. No best friends on vacation. So that's a start. How about play dates? Okay, so I just spoke. I know you have a lot to say on play I do. I spoke. And I'm personally very into play dates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I spoke uh, just, uh, gosh, 10 days ago at Milwaukee Jewish Day School. And unlike most schools, unlike the most K-8 schools, they said, we don't want to hear, we have no interest in social media and video games. We want to talk about best practice for parents of kids three, four, five, six years of age. So my talk was titled, Cancel the Play Date, Make a Family Date Instead. And the point of the talk was to present the research showing that, look, what matters for your three-year-old, your four-year-old, your five-year-old, your six-year-old is the quality of their relationship with you, not the quality of their relationship with same age, age peers. We've got research, which I present, showing that if a five-year-old has a strong relationship and a loving relationship with their parent, and their parent is clearly their primary attachment, you've greatly decreased the risk that that kid's going to be anxious or depressed seven or ten years later. If that kid has great relations with their same age peers, it has no benefit in terms of decreasing the risk of anxiety and depression seven, ten years down the road. I'm not saying same age peers are bad. They're not. They're fine. But they're much less important. And we're all busy. And parenting is all about making choices and not having enough time. If you, if you only have a little bit of time on a Saturday afternoon, that time should be you and your child doing something fun together, not you driving the kid across town to have a play date with somebody else's kid. It seems that parents, they feel that they're giving their children more and more, and it's better for the children if they can be on the play date, be with other kids, do all these activities, but it's not serving them all the time. So something good to be aware of. It's not. And again, one of the, one of the observations I've made, because I've spoken not only to parents in this country, but to parents in England and Scotland and Germany and Switzerland and Italy and Australia and New Zealand, and I find that American parents, unlike parents outside North America, American parents place too high a value on same-age peer relations. They think it's really important for their kid to be popular. It's not. It's just not. We've got good research on this point. In fact, the 13-year-old who is most popular with other 13-year-olds today is the kid most likely to be addicted to drugs or alcohol six years down the road. That wasn't true 40 years ago. It's true today. Being popular is now a major risk factor for bad outcomes. You don't want your kid to be the most popular kid. You want your kid to enjoy spending free time with you which is common in Australia, it's common in Scotland, it's common in Germany, it is rare in this country. It's rare among English-speaking kids in this country to choose to spend their free time hanging out with parents. You've got to change that dynamic. So no earbuds in the car, fewer playdates, suffers at home. You've given us a lot to think about. We have a few minutes left, so I'd like to take some questions from parents in the audience. We have a mic, so Aviva's going to bring the mic to you. This is for our Zoom audience. Thank you so much. That was amazing, and you've given me so much to think about. Um, I'm going to go back to something that you spoke about at the beginning of the night, which is this idea of humility and doing justice, which like, I, I understand and believe you that kids are kids don't have enough humility now, but they think they do because kids really believe in social justice now. So how can you recognize like this generation who believes that they're really just with the evidence that kids now don't understand humility and justice? Yeah, uh, I think those are different things. Uh, social justice is about being concerned about uh, inequality, about uh, race and ethnicity and poverty. And unfortunately, there is no contradiction uh, between a total lack of humility 
and <laughs> great concern for inequality. In fact, it's just another way of broadcasting the self. Look at me, I'm so great because I'm so concerned about those less fortunate. Uh, and it is, again, the Jewish tradition, I think, can, can, can bring you back. Uh, Psalm 51. David says, you know, what is, again, it's kind of David's version of the question Micah is asking. David says, does the Lord want me to sacrifice bulls? He says, no. Zivchai Elohim ruach nishbacha. Lev nidba venidka. Elohim lo the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, Lord, you will not despise. I've tried that, on, uh, I've tried that verse on kids, and it's, it's like a splash of cold water in their face. A broken spirit? You want me to have a broken spirit? Hey, I'm all for championing victims of inequality, but I don't want to have a broken spirit. This is the United States. I'm all about walking tall and standing proud. That's what we do. And I, I will show the kids a Justin Bieber song where he says, I'm going to light up the sky like lightning and this world will belong to me. That's contemporary American culture. And David's offering something radically different. A broken spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. So again, the Jewish tradition is subversive. I think is a fair word, in the sense that it is utterly opposed to this contemporary American culture that's all about me. Uh, Proverbs 11, um, um, the uh, English is, um, with pride comes dishonor, but with humility, wisdom. With pride comes dishonor, but with humility, wisdom. So, yeah, this kid who's out there championing social justice warrior, uh, they tend to be pretty proud individuals. They are not uh, humble in the Jewish sense. So I just wanted to go back to also to the conversation about boys. And you brought up um, all boys school at some point in the conversation and you referenced it. You didn't speak specifically about it, but you referenced an all boys school at some point. Um, or perhaps that's just where my mind went. But where I'm going with this is, is there any research that shows that in all boys school, um, you know, that they do a better job at promoting um, more successful outcomes for boys? I did reference it. I'm, I talked about Andrew Phillips, uh, and he's given me permission. Uh, this was 20 years ago. He's an adult now. He's given me permission to mention his real name. But he's the boy who came home at six years of age and threw all his art stuff in the garbage because the teacher gave everyone else a gold star. And her mother, his mother transferred him to Modern Day, an all-boys school in Montgomery County, Maryland. And he's gone on. He's had a great career. He went to Stanford. He's happily married with two kids. We're still in touch. Um, and I was so impressed by these stories I was learning of in my practice in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a little unusual. Uh, like Manhattan, Montgomery County, Maryland has a lot of boys' elementary schools. And so I saw stories where boys were struggling in the co-ed school and went to the boys' school and did well. And uh, so Janet and I launched an organization called the National Association for Single-Sex Public Education to make boys' public schools more available. Uh, and I was very involved in that from 2003 through 2012 when the ACLU shut us down, which is a, a story that I can share if anyone is interested after the Zoom. Um, uh, the uh, ACLU is a big organization and, and they have resources that dwarf ours and they've resorted to some very um, unethical activities to, to shut us down. Uh, but having said that, no, a boys' school is not the solution. The solution is a school that understands what boys need. But co-ed schools can do that. 
And the worst school I have visited in the world is a leading boys' school. Uh, just putting boys in a room without girls does not produce gentlemen and scholars. It can create an environment where the jocks beat up the geeks while the teachers say boys will be boys, and I've seen this firsthand. So boys' school is not the solution. It might be a solution if it's the right boys' school for the right boy. But most of my workshops for teachers now are at co-ed schools because the good news is that you don't need men and you don't need a boys' school. You need teachers who know and care how to teach boys. And you can share these strategies with them. And women teaching boys are very happy to learn and very interested in, in learning them. So you need to find a school that's friendly to boys, not necessarily a boys' school. Got the microphone there. <laughs> Somebody got to grab it. Firstly, thank you very, very much. Um, it was incredible and very educational, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, just a hypothetical. So um, going back to girls and social media, I wonder if we were to take social media completely away from our girl, what would be the psychological impact, if at all, uh, on her um, resulting from feeling like she's a misfit? Uh, well, first of all, let me get personal. Uh, my daughter, who is 16 and in 10th grade, has never been on social media. And uh, I've had the great privilege of speaking at J. Sarah Catholic High School in San Juan Capistrano. This fall will be my seventh consecutive year speaking to parents there. And last year, it was on my daughter's birthday uh, in August, so she came with me. It was kind of her birthday present. And the uh, school vice president, Pat Reedy, interviewed both of us, but it was mostly her. And he grilled her on exactly the questions you're asking. He said, is it true, Dr. Sachs says, you don't have any social media? She said, yeah, it's true. Is that because he won't let you? No, it's not because he won't let me. It's because I don't want any. Why don't you want any? And that uh, interview is posted online. If you can't find it, J. Sarah Catholic High School and my daughter, uh, just email me, I'll send you the link. And I was very proud of her because she makes a very persuasive case. But it's not unique to her. When I visit high school kids, it's always question and answer. And I ask the kids, who's on social media? Most of the kids raise their hand. Who's not? Some kids raise their hand. And I'll call on the girls. I'll say, who's, why? would you care to share with your friends? Why are you not on social media? And they answer very much like my girls, my, my daughter does. They say, because I have a life. Because I have better things to do with my time than look at other, other girls' videos on Instagram, uh, pictures on Instagram or videos on TikTok. I've got better things to do. And that's what you want your daughter to understand that, look, Human life has so many opportunities and possibilities. To spend your time looking at a screen is an impoverished and flattened understanding of what you can do uh, with, with your life. Uh, it's not three-dimensional. Um, so, but you need to empower parents because um, if your daughter's already been sucked in, it's going to be hard. Uh, but uh, a major objective of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, is to give parents the courage to do the right thing, to limit, govern, and guide what your kids are doing with their devices. Uh, and that means, talking about concrete recommendations, that means no phones in the bedroom. At 9 o'clock at night, the very latest, you take the device from your kid, you switch it off, and you put it in the charger, which from now on is going to be in the parent's bedroom. This has to be your call. Again, Jennifer Finney Boylan at the New York Times says good parenting means letting kids decide. And in some domains that may be true, but not in this domain. In the question of whether or not a kid's gonna have a phone in their bedroom, it is not reasonable, it is not age appropriate to dump that decision in the lap of your 14-year-old. What's she supposed to say tomorrow in school 
When her friend says, hey, I texted you last night at midnight, how come you didn't answer? Is she supposed to say, well, researchers at Stanford have found that sleep deprivation in adolescence is a major risk factor in the etiology of both anxiety and depression. It's ridiculous. You can't expect a kid to talk that way. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents take my phone every night at nine. Well, they head back till the next morning. It is your job to be the evil parent, to take the phone, to shut it down, put it in the, uh, to limit what kids are doing on social media, to limit kids' access to social media. Again, there's many parental monitoring apps that make this uh, possible. You've got to explain to your kid why this is important. Explain uh, the rationale behind what you're doing. If I may, because I've read all your books, parents need to mind their own phone use in front of their kids. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the most, I think the most heartbreaking encounter I've had in any of my school visits. So I was speaking at an uh, independent school near Towson, Maryland. And again, uh, assemblies with kids in the morning, workshop for teachers in the afternoon, speaking to parents in the evening. We found that's useful because I'll explain to the kids, hey, here are the guidelines, here's the research. I'm going to, so as I said to these kids at this middle school, I said, this evening I'm going to meet with some of your parents and I'm going to tell them to limit your time on social media. I'm going to explain to them how to install apps on your device that will shut you down, lock you out of social media after 30 minutes and you can't log in for another 24 hours. And we found when you do this, it makes it easier then for the parents because it's not just mom being mean. The kid understands the parents are following the guidelines of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, so I said, I'm going to explain to your parents how to, how to limit your access to social media so you will be locked out after 30 minutes. And a boy raised his hand, and I called on him. And he said, can you, can you teach me how to install that on my mom's phone? <laughs> and he then, he was dead serious. He then proceeded to tell the entire middle school how he comes home from school and he's trying to talk to his mom and his mom is looking at her phone, giving distracted one word answers, not even paying attention, looking at her own phone instead of talking with her son. And that just broke my heart because here's this boy telling the whole school that his mother would rather look at her Instagram than listen to her son. Yeah, I took some notes, and to your great credit, you microphone. answered some of them <laughs> before. I'll tell you what they are. I put a check mark after um, uh, it's a tug of war between the parents and peer pressure, and peer pressure won. That was one of the things I wanted to mention, which I just did, but it was already answered. And the other thing is... Um, um, so, social media, and we're talking just about social media. We're not talking about the great, uh, every other thing that you can learn on, on your phone, your whatever, whatever device you use, it's, it's fabulous. So it's what you choose to use on the phone. It's the platforms that you get on, or the, the ones that you, you guys can say, they should avoid, according to the parents. So they made the choice. And you just uh, uh, spoke about those who choose not to get on. Their choice, not just the parents. So they're wise enough to know what's good for them and what's not good for them. And, they could, and, and those who use social media, well, maybe they use the phone for other purposes as well. But since we're concentrating just on so the social media aspect, we have to separate the two. Um, and what sites you get onto. But there's another thing you mentioned about the boys who got in trouble. For what I say, it's boys being boys. When I was a kid, it was toy soldiers and cap guns and stuff. That was normal. None of us became child molesters or mass murderers. It was a kid thing to do. But when you say that the parents have the option of doing, of sending it children to another school, I don't know what it's like outside of New York, but it's not that easy. Because we have a big problem here with parents who would love to send their children to another school, to a charter school, can't do it. Or it's extremely difficult and time consuming. Time consuming meaning years. And between the third and fifth or the sixth or seventh grade until they can do it, if they ever can do it, 
So you're talking about the difficulty of switching schools. And as I shared earlier, my wife and I made the decision to leave Montgomery County, Maryland, sell our home, sell my medical practice, get a new job in Chester County, Pennsylvania, buy a new home, because we were not happy with the choice of schools available to us. And that is something you may have to do. Your child has to be your first priority. And if you cannot find a good school, uh, then you may have to move. I think we have time for one more question. I saw a hand. I don't know if I'm going to speak loud. Um, first off, thank you. Um, I guess just to piggyback on, on that point made about making a hard, making a choice or doing something in your life that may be hard, like you mentioned, moving, selling your practice, etc. So in that, like, in that context, what about like just in the discussion of things that are difficult is the parents who work. So you mentioned like play dates and, you know, hanging out with peers and how that, you know, the quality time with parents obviously should be paramount to that. But what do you do in many instances where you can't achieve that ideal of everybody being home around the dinner table? And I know you said one parent, but let's say, you know, just giving hypotheticals of a parent needing to work late. Is it better for the child to stay home? And I guess, in, in this hypothetical or ideal, they wouldn't even be home with a device, like be home by themselves where the babysitter figuring things out, like playing, whatever, or playing with friends. So what we can say with confidence is the device should not be a babysitter. Uh, and again, I spoke in Milwaukee Jewish Day School on exactly this question, uh, namely, you're busy, you just got home, you've got to make supper, you've got a three-year-old. Is it really so terrible to sit them down in front of SpongeBob SquarePants so that you can get your supper made? And the answer is yes, it is terrible. Don't do that. Well, what are you supposed to do? You don't have time to sit and play with your child. Well, you don't have to sit and play with your child. Bring your child into the task. Kids love to help. Uh, and this is true, you start in infancy. So let's suppose it's not a three-year-old, it's a 10-month-old. Uh, I'm writing a revision of the collapse of parenting right now. The publisher has asked me to write an updated second ev uh, edition, and I'm addressing exactly this point. I've got a picture of a father with a front-facing papoose. And you've got your 10-month-old in the front face pacing for poos, and you're making supper. And you're telling, explaining what you're doing. Okay, now we got to chop up the onions. Now we got to rip up the lettuce, and let's mix it all together. And now your child's three years old. Okay, you need to think of a supper that your three-year-old can help. Three-year-olds can shred lettuce. And I've got great pictures to include to show them shredding the lettuce. And they love to do it. They want to be a part of. They want to be helpers. Kids are not born knowing what the rules are. And unfortunately, in many American families, we're teaching kids at two, three, four, five, six, seven years of age, your job is to sit and be entertained while my job is to make your supper. And then the kid is nine and we say, hey, you're old enough to help. And they're like, no, I don't want to help. I want to sit and watch my show because that's all they know. That's the rules that they have learned. In traditional cultures, we find that uh, kids are helping at early ages, and we can do that. Uh, many of you may know Mechaline Duclef's book, Hunt, Gather, Parent, uh, which I really have mixed feelings about. Uh, it has some of the worst elements of a self-help book, which is, this worked for my daughter, Rosie, therefore I'm sure it'll work for you. And, and that's not good. But on the other hand, she spent time with parents in the Arctic, uh, Inupiaq and, and uh, uh, native Alaskan parents. She spent parents uh, time with traditional families in Mexico. And those kids are not playing while the parents are working. Those kids are helping the parents. They're asking to do chores because that's how they've been raised. And kids want to feel that they're contributing. So yeah, I understand everybody's busy, but We've got to break out this uh, American, Western European notion of the kid's job is to be entertained while I slave. That's not healthy. It's not good. It's not 
in the best interest of kids. We've got to reconfigure the way we make supper, among other things, so that young kids can, can help us. Well, you've left us with so much to think about. And to quote you in your book, in order to be a better parent, we need to be better people. So you've left us with so many profound and inspiring ideas, and I hope we'll take this home with us and bring some positive culture into our own homes. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.